I think in my situation, the the only person um, or people my were my parents who mm-hmm. asked like, you know, hey, what about this person? Yeah. You know, what do we need to do um, to, you know, get you peace, justice, whatever it might be. But every other leader treated it as if there was an issue with me that they needed to fix. And mm-hmm. so as somebody who has been victimized, it really is just re-traumatizing yeah. to, to think that, oh, well, now I have to like fix myself mm-hmm. instead of thinking, you know, I just, I want to be heard. I, I just need to figure out what actually is happening. And, and they want to put me through some kind of counseling to, you know, reclaim my purity, like, yeah. you know, stupid stuff like that is said. And you really, that hurt for me because I was so young and because it was limited exposure, I had probably three encounters with that person. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know, you know, other than like, I, I have some memory of it and, mm-hmm. you know, I don't have this deep seated, like, hurt from it that I feel like I hold on to what is more hurtful in my situation, at least is the fact that it was over and over and over again, right. something that was my fault. It, yeah. At least that's how I was made to feel. So, right. Yeah. And when you say they wanted to counsel or there was an issue with you, was mm-hmm. it, were they coming at it more from, you know, Oh, you need to get over this. You shouldn't be bitter about it. Was it more of, you know, Hey, you're at fault too. Cause I know that's common, but, um, I and don't, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I don't think that they would say that. I hope they wouldn't say that considering the age at which it happened, but stranger things have happened. Right. Um, I mean, the fact that, I mean, one thing, the fact that we equate purity with the fact that we, that whole subject so odd, but the fact that yeah. we would, that someone would make a claim that a five-year-old can lose their purity because of something that happens to them without any possibility of them ever consenting to it is insane. Yes. <laughs> so I think that nothing was ever overtly said as far as I had guilt in it. It was just communicated to me that I was now tainted by it, mm. um, you know, simply because the, pur- the purity culture, excuse me, is so strong in the IFB. And when you are dealing with, you know, this, I mean, even if it's molestation, I guess they still equate it with the act. And it's so, ugh, I don't know, <laughs> there's such a disconnect you know between sexuality and being molested Mm. that if there's nobody professional to help you through some of these you know feelings and things especially when this is happening at such a young age it can just be mind numbing and so I'll give you an example too so like I said I decided to kind of keep the peace and go off to Hiles Anderson College and you know that's stuff that I've dealt with you know, in therapy as well is my, um, so I left right after the scandal. I was in high school when, um, Jack Hiles was on hard copy and all that. And I remember my parents saying, you know, like they just couldn't believe that people were attacking him like this. And, um, after, you know, learning the history now and understanding the like real evidence that was coming out around that time, it's, you know, I've had to reconcile the fact that like my parents sent me up there (laughs) and there I went. Um, And when that happened, so my dad studied there from the time I was four to the time I was six years old. And then we moved back to St. Louis, um, where I lived until um, I went back to college. And by the time I went, uh, oh, no, sorry, I was four. And I we came back when I was 10. That's what it was. So it was about six years. And um, so I went to, you know, the conferences, um, at youth conference and things like that. So I had been there a couple of times, but it really wasn't until I went to college and started working in the uh, Bible club ministry right there in Hammond that I just had this overload and I started having panic attacks and flashbacks and a couple of the girls, um, who I had kind of reconnected with because our parents had gone to college at the same time and we had come back 
together, um, they noticed that there was something off. I had been in the infirmary a few times with strep throat. I had, you know, just gotten myself into such a shape that, um, you know, one of the girls was like, you know, tell me what's going on. And, and I confided in her. What's interesting is though, I found that this was not uncommon during that time. So this would have been uh, right around the same time too, that um, David Hiles, that whole scandal went down with him and he was kind of sent away. And he, so he was the youth pastor. Um, and apparently there was a group of boys and this is alleged, I, I cannot prove this, but there was a group of boys within the youth uh, ministry who kind of had this um, competition going on to see how many girls that they could, um, you know, take their virginity or who even knows or molest. I have no idea, but um, there was a ring of, boys, according to this, you know, a couple of the girls that I went to college with who are doing the same things. And so I, I've heard that as well. Okay. I've had a couple of okay. people that have brought that up enough. I don't have anything I can, I mean, I don't think you ever could have something to point to as evidence, but I've heard enough stories from enough unconnected people that it seems fairly credible that something right. like that was happening. Yeah. So, um, one after the other, you know, they shared their stories too, and they were the same as mine. And um, so finally, because, I, you know, the, I continued to go into Hammond on Saturdays because that was our Bible club area. And I continued to have these like, you know, just panic attacks and um, flashbacks and uh, hyperventilating. I think I passed out once. I actually um, was partially paralyzed during my years there. Um because of some of the issues that were going on. And I believe now after years of treatment and things that it was um, psychologically based, but um, anyway, so I ended up going to a leader and she told me that I needed to, I didn't trust men because of what happened to me. So I needed to go to Jack Scott and have counseling. And so I stood in his line. I'm not sure if anybody's told this (laughs) story, like, you know, of what the practices were, at least back then you would stand in line. They had counseling hours. You would stand in line and they would like let people in 10 minutes at a time. Cause of course, you know, that's going (laughs) to fix things. Um, so I did, I stood in that line and I told him why I was there, who told me to go there. And it was the most bizarre thing one of the most bizarre things that ever happened to me while I was there. And I really respected Jack Scott. I had been infatuated with him and his preaching. Um, He was traveling the country at that time. He was, you know, his office was in this like little dungeon, basically a hallway. So he, he was obviously the leader's son-in-law, but he was also just a teacher. So it felt like, Oh, you know, like he's trustworthy. And, um, some of the things I see now that he did in that meeting were just grooming tactics. Um, so for example, he asked me, you know, cause I was shaking when I was in there. He's like, Oh, you know, what's going on. So he put his hands on me, which I mean, this is the IFB world. This is like, you know, a guy that's related to the top dog. You put your hands on somebody. And I mean, it wasn't, you know, I think it was on my shoulders or maybe it was on my knees actually. Cause I was standing, we were standing face to face or sitting face to face. And he's like, Hey, I see that you're shaking. Why don't you start by just telling me a little bit then about your dad? Cause he knew that my um, dad had gone to college there. He got out a yearbook. I showed him my dad's picture. And then I told him why I was sent there. And so one of the practices that he had me do was, uh, you know, first he said, well, you know, you're, you're a beautiful girl. Okay. Red flag number one <laughs> for those of you listening. Um, and it made, it just kind of reinforced that whole idea of, Oh, you're putting this on me again. And then he said, what you need to do is you need to learn that you can trust men again. So I'm going to say you're beautiful and you have to say, thank you. And so we re- repeated that exercise back and forth a few times. And then I, I can't remember exactly how the conversation went. It's been a good many years now, but I left that space thinking that was 0% helpful and I will never go back. 